State parks, uh, youth leagues, whatever exactly it's called, I'm not sure. But then from there, uh, started playing uh, junior All-American through the sub Suburban Hornets. And at eight years old, Mario was, was my first coach and uh, made a huge impact on me. Uh, and he, along with, with so many other coaches, I, I, I say this whenever I'm anywhere talking about coaching. In fact, my Hall of Fame speech was really intended uh, to honor the coaches, uh, both those that were a part of my professional career and collegiate career, but also those like Mario Roscoe and Manny Gisalva and Rod Davis and Ron Stillman and E.G. Clayton, a number of guys that, that really made a huge difference uh, for me when I, was, when I was growing up here in the city of Cerritos. This is a, this is a special place, and it was extremely special uh, for me. There were, as I said, unbelievable coaches, and a lot of them, Mario was young. Uh, I didn't realize how young, uh, but he was, he was just 21. He was telling me tonight when he was coaching the team, didn't, you know, didn't have a child on the team. And, uh, and I had some other coaches like that. And so they did it, you know, not out of obligation because they had children playing. They really did it because they, they had a passion for it. They had a love for the game. They really wanted to, to help teach the game to some young, young kids that could help make a difference. And, and over the years, what I've seen, at least through my own experiences, are there some really great coaches. And I had a chance to play for some historical coaches. I mean, Jimmy Johnson, Barry Switzer, you know, Terry Donahue, and a number of others, Ernie Zampezi. But the, but the guys that, that do it at the youth level, you know, you all are the ones that, that really impact the kids and get them going in the right direction. And, and it's not lost on any of us. I mean, we, we introduced Russ Warnick, a teammate of mine, he's my left tackle there at UCLA when I was playing, and he's got those same stories, I know. And, and even those that didn't go on and play major college football or professional football, every one of you in this room that played, you've got a story about a coach that touched you and made a difference. And, and uh, it just so happens that I had some outstanding ones here in Cerritos, and, and I'm thankful for it, and this place will always be very special to me. Your early coaches. What do you think was the biggest influence on you, what they had to do, what would you say? What did they influence you the most? Well, I think that the, the, they, they allowed me to maintain a love of the game. I, I think that that can be taken away pretty quickly. I've got, I've got young daughters, I've got 10 and 11 year old girls, and, and so I know what those experiences are like for them. Uh, and and I, you, know, you want them to enjoy it, you want them to come away from the experiences you know, gaining confidence in themselves, and and that's that's what I try to tell them. You know, I mean, I said in the deal that my, my my dream, my dad used to always ask me from the time I was you know seven years old. You know, hey son, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I don't ever remember wanting to be anything other than a professional athlete. And and so I'm one of the fortunate ones. But you know, the reality is, is not many guys get that opportunity. And I don't anticipate that my daughters are going to go on and, and play professional sports. But I want them playing sports, and I want them learning about teamwork. I want them learning about sportsmanship. I want them to learn about sacrifice and, and committing to the team. And I want coaches to hold them accountable to those to those values. And so those were the things that 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 I gained from it. You know, I, I felt that they really instilled. Well, fundamentally, I got taught very well. I got coached very well. But but it goes beyond that. I, I think that that they they made me and our teams accountable and taught us the right way to play. And I think that's so true about our, our coaches here in Cerritos. Many of us have coached, and all these out here now that we're honoring tonight have, have spent many hours, and, and the dedication they have to teach those kids, the kids, the values that we were just talking about is so important. Let me ask you another question. As a quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, you led your team to victory in three Super Bowls. Give me a couple of your favorite memories from, from those Super Bowls. Well, those are, you know, the first one, well, let me just backtrack. I mean, my first year, we were, we were the, I, when I got to Dallas, we were the worst team in football, you know, and that's why I got picked to go there. You know, so, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, the number one draft choice, yeah. right? <laughs> and, uh, and then, unfortunately, after my first year, you know, I didn't really make much of an impact. We were still the worst team in football. You know? so I think they might have been wondering why we brought this guy in. But, uh, you know, three years after that, we were, you know, on top of the mountain. We were hoisting up the Lombardi Trophy. So it was a, it was a, an amazing turnaround. That was unprecedented in, in those years. I mean, now you, you see it because the, the game certainly has changed a little bit. But, you know, the Super Bowls, what, what, 
first of all, I, I'm, I'm thankful that, uh, that I won three Super Bowls and that 12 years after I came into the league that you know, a lot of really great things happened uh, for me and for our team because you, know, you don't want to go into the game and come out of it and then say, you know, well, you remember that bust in 89 that came, <laughs> came into the league and didn't do anything? So you know, I was thankful from that perspective, but what I remember really uh, is the first Super Bowl we won when it became apparent we were going to win the game. Uh, I was coming off the field and I saw a bunch of guys, my teammates, many of whom were told that we would never win with them. And early on we did, you know, and so that was an easy projection, but we did win. We, had, we, we ended up winning a world championship and I remember the enthusiasm, the celebration that was taking place and the smiles and just a lot of weight being taken off a lot of people's shoulders and saying, you know what, we did do it. We did it with the guys that they said we couldn't do it with. And, uh, and that really, I mean, that may sound corny, but that really is what I remember the most about the Super Bowl, at least the first one that I was a part of. And, you know, anyone who's played athletics, you remember the games, you have laughs about them, you, you know, about the plays, and you tend to remember and have more fun about some of the really bad plays that happened, you know, when you get beyond it all. But uh, what, what, I, what I enjoyed most about my experiences uh, throughout my career were the guys that I forged relationships with, Guys like Russ, you know, I mean, hey, he could be doing a lot of other things tonight, you know, but he's here and enjoying this, and uh, and I got great friends through it, through athletics, you know, and there's always a common bond, uh, people who serve in the services, you know, and you know, there, when there's something that hey, you always know that person's going to be there, and and so I've got a lot of those friends over the years, and you can't replace those. Hard to. Um, what about your experience as an athlete? How'd that help you now in your broadcasting career? Well, I think the, uh, first of all, it got me my broadcasting career. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but, I, you know, it's, uh, it's a little cliche that I think that as athletes, you know what it takes to, to, to be good at, in sports, and, and you work hard at it. Uh, you know, when, when I was a player, if I wasn't good at throwing a particular route, well, then I would just spend extra time throwing that route. And, you know, you work at it and work at it till you get it down. I think that's like, it's like that in, in, in all sports, really. Whereas in business, certainly in broadcasting, you don't, it doesn't quite happen like that, you know? And so in broadcasting, you can't, you can't practice. Uh, your practices are in front of a live audience, you know? And so it comes a little bit slower. And in, in business, I, you know, I've owned some car dealerships, I've been involved with some different businesses that uh, it's, it's, it's not as easy to just say, okay, you go out and you work hard and these things happen. Um, because you don't have the results that occur as readily, but the principles are still the same. I, I, I think that, you know, I don't think there's any shortcuts. I try to teach my girls that. I don't think there's shortcuts in life. There's certainly not shortcuts in success. And you have to put in the time. And, and uh, those that do, uh, I believe, because of my own experiences, that, uh, that they'll have success. You know, now then that gets into a whole other topic as to how you define that. But uh, that, that's my, that's essentially my belief. I think probably for many of us in the room, I know for me, when we listen to a pro game, it's nice to listen to someone who's been there and done that. Because yeah. you know they know what they're talking about. A lot of times we have broadcasters that it's never been there and done that, and they don't have that true experience that you had out on the field. Well, believe me, I've got my critics that know I had been there and done that, and, I, and they still don't think I should be talking about it. So. <laughs> I don't know, with three Emmy nominations, uh, with three Emmy nominations, somebody believes yeah, in you. somebody. I mentioned earlier about his foundation. Um, you have generously given back to society through the Troy Aiken Foundation. What are some of the projects your foundation has supported? Tell us a little bit about the foundation. Yeah, you know, in, uh, in 1992, I started the foundation and, and wanted to, you know, give back to the community and, and predominantly make it about kids. And, and so we did that, and our objective when we started was uh, we were going to try to take care of kids that kind of fall through the cracks. I mean, there's a lot of organizations out there, and, but we weren't really meeting those needs, and I didn't feel like we were hearing from the right people. And so uh, we got together as a board and discussed it, and what we then began doing was we, we started putting in interactive playrooms within children's hospitals, and it's a, it was a chance for... For kids, unfortunately, many of them in terminal situations uh, to escape their own reality for you know a period of time, 
and go into these playrooms and, and be kids, you know, and, uh, and so that's what we did. And that was the whole premise behind it. I wanted something that we could tangibly see that the money was helping. And, but something really strange from that came out of it. And that is that the kids that were utilizing these, we call them end zones, now they're called zones, but the kids that were, in, that were utilizing these playrooms, <clears throat> they were requiring uh, less pain medicine, uh, their recovery was coming along much quicker for those that were, were not dealing with uh, you know some of the terminal terminal illnesses and and this kind of goes I think you do things for the right reasons and you try to make good decisions and, and then things just kind of tend to take care of themselves and what happened was Garth Brooks <coughs> who some of the younger people in this audience you know I, I hate to say it may not even know who he is but um, I know. He went, through, uh, he went through one of our zones in Oklahoma City, and as soon as he walked in, he got it. And so we then began this partnership, he and I did, to where we've been able to go in, uh, and we've put zones now, we're in New York City, we're in Denver, Atlanta, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, we've got one that we're uh, working on in Israel. Uh, we've, we've, we've got them in Oklahoma, Texas, so we're, we're, we're all over the place. And uh, my foundation recently just merged with Garth's. We just decided to do everything, do everything in house. But uh, he's about as solid and as special a guy as, as there is. I mean, he's a remarkable individual. Uh, I laugh because he 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 hasn't sang in ten years. You know, I mean, he gave up his career for his kids, and, and his youngest is a sophomore in high school, and she's going to be going off to college. And when she does. Uh, he's making his comeback, and I'm really anxious because I <laughs> fully believe in Garth Brooks. But there's, uh, there's, there's. My girls have no idea who Garth Brooks is. You know I mean? So you know they know who Taylor Swift is, and they yeah. know who Justin Bieber is. So Garth's got, he's got some competition out there. You know, we'll see, we'll see how he does. But I wouldn't bet against him. Well, it's a great foundation, and uh, appreciate what you do with that. And to know, I didn't know it was all over the United States that you have place that hospital. It's awesome. Um, tonight we've got a room full of coaches. People have given their time to volunteer. Uh, why do you feel it's important to give back to the community and to serve as a volunteer? Well, I admire those that do. You know, I, I think it's important to I think it's important to do what you can and you know where that then falls on you know each individual's scale of importance is, is, a, is an entirely different matter. But uh, I've always I've always held people in very, very high regard uh, that have given of themselves for no reason other than they do want to give back, they want to make someone's life better, they want to make, you know, they want to, uh, it goes back to the coaches that I talked about. Um, they, they coached because they had a passion for the game, but I think beyond that they really wanted to make a difference in, in some young kids' lives, and I can tell you they made a difference in mine, and, and many, many others. And so. Those are special people, you know, they really are. And, and you know, at the risk of getting corny, I, I really do, I really do believe there's angels among us, you know, and whether you do or you don't, I think if you look at some of the people who really do volunteer their time and, and give of themselves unselfishly to help others, uh, it, it's hard for me not to walk away from those kinds of people and say, well, something's different about them. And there's a special place in heaven for those people, I, I really believe. But uh, it's a it's a great uh, it's a great thing we're doing here. It's great that all of you are being recognized, and I I thank you on behalf of really you know all the kids across America, and certainly the kids here in, in Cerritos, California, the ones that you're impacting for for really making a difference in their lives. I mean, you don't know, you really don't know. You know, I bet Mario Roscoe never knew what an impact he was having on me, you know, at the time that he was coaching me, you know, but, uh, but I remember those guys, and, and uh, it's important because I, I thought the, the, the guys that do it at the higher levels, I mean, they're making a difference too, but boy, these youth coaches are special.